I'd like to talk briefly now about, well, not actually briefly at all, about traditional or about the homeland of Inupiat people and of Inuit people more generally, the homelands of Inuit people, and ramifications that had for traditional culture prior to colonialism. But when I say prior to colonialism, we should recognize that uh, Inuit, Inuit societies and Inupiat communities, many of these communities still continued on in these ways well into the 1900s, and to some degree still in the 2000s. There's alterations, right? People now have stores where they buy some of their food from, people have snowmobiles and rifles, but to a great degree, a lot of, in a lot of Inupiat communities, there's still a lot of hunting. There's still a lot of having to adapt to the ice. There's different forms of homes now, obviously, as far as not just the traditional forms of homes anymore. Um, and hunting looks different, but still a lot of practices hold true still. So it's kind of a mixture of old and new, as it is indeed in most cultures um, in the 21st century. So let's talk a little bit about traditional Inuit culture as providing somewhat of a lens to present day culture. Again, although not thinking that this is exactly how things are nowadays. So, by and large, Inuit peoples are situated in what we call the tundra, which I don't need to tell you about because you're Alaskans, but is really one of the, arguably one of the least hospitable environments on Earth for humanity. And I base that partly on the fact that it's almost the exact opposite, environmentally speaking, from the place where humans uh, ostensibly evolved from, which anthropologists believe to be Eastern Africa. So if you think of Eastern Africa versus the tundra, they really could not be more dissimilar, dissimilar, uh, different from each other. And indeed, the tundra is very difficult in a number of different ways. It's effectively a frozen desert for considerable parts of the years, uh, even when it's not a frozen desert, even when it's not sort of covered largely with ice and permafrost, there's very small plants um, during the, you know, half of the year or so where it's not ice covered. There are large mammals, which is good, but there may be, you know, not large mammals just everywhere all the time always. And you know, there's challenges to living in the Arctic and you might think about that and you might pause the video and list some of what those challenges might be. I've got here a, um, let's see if this pulls up properly. I've got here on the side, it says, so you think Anchorage is cold? Because I know a lot of us listening to this lecture probably either live in Anchorage or on the peninsula. And I'm going to show you a little bit about the weather in the city that we formerly called Barrow, Alaska, now called Utkiakvik, which is the northernmost Alaskan city. So if we look at Anchorage weather, or sorry, um, Barrow's weather, a little bit of things to note. Let me find it. The average highest temperature for the whole year in the middle of July is 47 degrees. It is common in January and December for it to get as low as negative 20 or negative 10. According to this classification system, it never really gets above, quote, very cold. It ranges from frigid to freezing to very cold. And you have uh, cloudy, cloudy, cloudy for significant portions of the year. And of course, you have very extreme uh, sunlight dynamics, the midnight snow dynamic that we're, we get, you know, for the most part down here in southern Alaska is very pronounced in northern Alaska, where you do truly have days where there is never the sun going down. And you also have days where the sun barely comes up at all for a couple of months. So a very extreme place to make a living. In that environment, Inupiat people uh, for centuries have developed extremely innovative ways of making a living, even if it is not the place where humanity biologically arose from. Culture has provided the tools uh, and biocultural changes to allow for Inupiat people to live and Inuit people more generally to live in this extremely inhospitable environment. Uh, traditionally, Inuit society was generalized hunter-gatherers or generalized foragers, which is a term for anthropologists, what we mean by a generalized forager is, well, it's easier to explain what it's not. So specialized foraging society would be a group like um, Klamath and other groups in the Pacific Northwest where they eat a lot of different foods, but salmon is a huge portion of the diet, as would be berries. So a few foods are, you're heavily focused on a few foods. Generalized hunter-gatherers like Inuit traditionally uh, would have been eating lots and lots of different kinds of food. And the environment despite its inhospitality in some ways, has a lot of different foods. Sea mammals, uh, in some Inuit villages, you're kind of right where 
um, walruses come and migrate through, uh, other kinds of sea mammals, whales, shorebirds like murres and auklets, uh, a variety of kinds of seals, fish such as cod, polar bears, which were sometimes hunted, caribou, muskox. You also do have a number of plants for about half of the year, four to six months. So roots and plants and grasses and berries in the tundra environment during certain months of the year. Now, and there was also a tendency to kind of do an all of the above approach where you had some aquatic hunting, people going out in kayaks and hunting whales. You also had ice hunting where you, you know, drill a hole in the ice or hunt seals on the ice and then also terrestrial hunting. And that would sometimes be seasonal where during the summer, it's like what the book was, what your reading was talking about, sort of in the summer, move into a summer camp, which in the example from the book, like right on an island where you've got really good access to things like the walrus hunting um, and, oh, I'm sorry, that would be the winter grounds. Uh, to, good access to these kind of aquatic mammals in ocean water that's not going to freeze as easily, and then the summer moving inland and making use of things like those large mammals and stuff that you can hunt easier in the summer. But again, it's a difficult place to live, um, and again, inhospitable, and I don't mean to say that to be insulting of the tundra, and also, of course, that's a cultural judgment, because if you grow up in the tundra, the tundra might not seem inhospitable at all, but from a human biological perspective, it's a difficult place to for humanity to have set up shop, because you kind of have six months or so, sometimes less of this, but you have about six months or more of this, and that actually raises a pretty significant quandary in terms of how do you keep a healthy diet during the six months or so which are effectively winter because of course humans are omnivore i forgot to put an s there so it literally says humans are omnivore as if we're all one omnivore <laughs> humans are omnivore i'm talking like one of those stereotypical cavemen in a tv show or something um, humans are omnivorous is what that should say we are not only do we eat both meat and plants, but to a great degree our bodies like to eat both meat and plants, which is one of the reasons why if you eat a vegetarian or a vegan diet, you have to find alternative sources of protein. Um, and of course, the Arctic tundra poses almost the exact other problem, which is that for about 50% of the year, plants are mostly absent. Uh, so where do you get all the things that you would normally get from plants? Carbs, fiber, vitamins, especially vitamin C, which prevents scurvy, which nobody wants that. So there was a study done back in the 40s, um, which of course there was, people were still pretty much entirely reliant at that point on hunting gathering uh, by a scholar by the name of Stefansson. I don't know his first name, so let's just make up a cool one. Um, Henry, Henry Stefansson. Anyways, he found that Inuit folks during the winter uh, were getting a really well-balanced diet. And in fact, his study suggested that as people were becoming more, quote, westernized, their diets were actually getting less healthy, which makes sense, right? Canned food and packaged food versus um, wild fresh food. But again, what about carbs and vitamin C? And it's kind of those basic things you need to keep going. He pointed out that sometimes certain kinds of raw meat was eaten, which I do not recommend doing this at home. Your professor is not encouraging you to eat raw meat. Uh, but certain kinds of raw meat that were done, that were eaten, that were safe to eat and um, and you know, people were using the types that they knew would be appropriate and in the ways that they knew would allow for that. And with certain types of raw meat of certain types of marine mammals, you get a lot of glycogen on the surface of their skin. And glycogen is essentially a modified form of glucose. So there's your carbs. Uh, it might be a little Atkins diety in the sense that it's very low carbs, but it's carbs. And then you're getting vitamin C from eating whale skin and a certain kind of seal's liver, both of which contain vitamin C. And so you prevent scurvy and you still got your carbs going. Pretty freaking incredible. Uh, and that is my scientific opinion. It shows us the versatility and adaptability of culture and the tremendous amount of dietary knowledge that would have been required for Inupiat people to figure out the best possible way of using uh, very limited resources during the winter to meet basic dietary needs. It suggests, I think, something that we don't always realize, which is the extensive dietary knowledge that cultures uh, possessed long before there was a formal science called dietitians. All right. There was also complex, was and is, complex technology used to make use of this environment. Uh, fishing, boating technology, that's somewhat obvious in the sense that we've talked about it with um, in the Alutic lecture, but uh, kayaks as an incredibly good, mobile, fast-moving, agile form of boating that allows one or a few hunters to get out into the water, to get there quickly, to navigate well, to find the animals that they're hunting. There's other things as well. 
traditionally arctic wolves would have been a major would have been a competitor for kills like you kill an animal and then arctic wolves come and gulp it up and nobody wants to be fighting wolves because generally speaking a wolf can take out a human all things considered if the human's not armed with a firearm and maybe even if they are now of course humans and wolves don't thankfully fight all that often but the concern here is not fighting so much as meat scavenging that wolves would be scavenging kills if you're maybe let's say you've got a kill there but they sneak up on it or you're away for a minute you've gone back to the village to get something and then come back whatever the case may be so what would be done traditionally would be by some communities would be to take a piece of whalebone a specific type of whalebone and curve it in on each other itself to make a spring and then bury that in the meat you know where it is and you obviously take it out before you eat the meat but if a wolf happens to come along and do what wolves sometimes do which is wolf down their food swallow it whole then the little spring does what a spring does in springs and presumably in their neck or their stomach and kills them um, and pretty brutal for the wolf which for me as a wolf lover is a little hard to hear but also you completely understand why this would be done to protect one's kill and the idea would be you'd sort of get rid of nuisance wolves by doing this uh, maybe there's specific wolves that are sort of predisposed to eat human food and you're kind of getting rid of them and of course the housing technology well, i'm not sure that that's the case or not but that would have at least perhaps been part of the theory um, obviously clothing traditionally was fur based and uh, allowed people to live in what is often sub-zero temperatures and although today Inuit people of course um, may or may not wear clothing like this most people would probably not be wearing clothes like this and be using other kinds of um, jackets but furs are still used sometimes definitely because they're kind of hard to beat a fur as far as um, being warm in the arctic so again culture kind of providing the means of survival I also thought it was interesting here that you can see even through decades of cultural change, kind of these common um, white, uh, brown and white alternating stripe patterns, also sort of the diversity of different clothing types between different groups and even different people within the same group. Maybe the coolest, at least from my perspective, technological adaptation of Inuit people would have been igloos. And I want to clarify what I mean by technology, by the way. You may have been surprised that I was referring to kayaks and whale bones and igloos as technology, uh, but you shouldn't be. Technology, from an anthropological perspective, does not need to involve running off of fossil fuels or electricity. Indeed, it's a very ethnocentric and parochial perspective to think that that's the only type of technology. Technology is material artifacts that humans have crafted to be useful to them. And in that regard, you do not need to have fossil fuels or electricity or something like that to make a form of technology. And indeed, we should regard these types of technology as every bit as sophisticated in their own right as, let's say, a microprocessor. They're sophisticated for different things. A, you know, a, a whalebone trap for a wolf cannot allow you to check your stocks on your laptop. But on the other hand, uh, a laptop cannot allow you to protect your food for your family generally speaking. So different technologies do different things and they're equally sophisticated and they've both come out of a hun hundreds of years of invention and adaptation and people tinkering. Igloos are no exception. Igloos are incredibly smart adaptations to the Arctic uh, tundra. In many ways, they replicate a snow cave if you've ever built a snow cave while hunting, but they do it better. They are carved out of blocks of ice, which are, you do a ring of ice, then you do another ring of ice that's comes in a little bit then another ring of ice that comes in a little bit more and eventually you get to the point where you're at the very top and the ring is very very small and then you put a, it would kind of topple in on itself for all the weight except for you put a keystone ice block in the middle of it that kind of causes counter pressure i'm not an architect don't ask me to explain this but causes counter pressure and it keeps everything together and then you carve a hole in the top brick that allows for uh, heat to escape and air to get in so heat to escape, like if you've lit a fire or something inside your igloo, and then air to get in so you don't suffocate to death. Pretty awesome. Not only is it pretty awesome, but there's some in, uh, interesting additional things that make it really awesome, one of which is that they, uh, Inuit people traditionally would be building uh, ice beds, and of course I suppose some people still do this, although it would be much less common nowadays. Nowadays most folks would be um, living in just um, other types of frame houses and things but ice beds where you have these like carved blocks of ice that you then put a blanket on and sleep on that and the point there is that you're elevating yourself towards the top of the igloo so that, that you're where the heat condenses right there in the domed top of the igloo which is really cool you have a passageway to get out over here sometimes a window built into it um, another thing is that people's um, 
hot breath. I, I don't know the other way to, any other way to say it. Maybe it's because it's too late at night, but people's um, hot breath, as humans have hot breath, um, cause is, and their body heat causes the walls to melt, which you would think would be a problem. Like you would only have an igloo for a day, except for then people go out during the day. And so during the day, it freezes over again and just makes another actually more solid form of ice now. Uh, so it kind of provides insulation, actually. Really, really cool stuff. By the way, in Yupiak, people do not, well, I should say traditionally, did not only use igloos. Instead, you had, during the summer, you would have tupik tents, which were made out of bone and wood and animal skin, and other forms of houses as well. Let's talk now briefly um, about Inuit traditional spirituality, which I call sacred nature, shamanism, songs, and stories, all of which would have been involved in Inuit society traditionally, and some of which still carries on in different ways in Inuit communities, and it's going to be for some people in some communities more than others. So traditionally within Inuit society, you have Ankakaks, which are shamans. Shamans is a term that actually comes from Siberia, but we indigenous groups in Siberia, but it's used by anthropologists to refer to a broad class of religious specialists who are typically part-time, aka they're also hunters like everybody else in their community or gatherers like everybody else in their community, but at least part of the time they do religious services for the community, typically religious services which revolve less around salvation like in a world religion and more around practical issues such as making sure that there's enough animals to hunt and healing people that are diseased. Ankakox definitely fall into the former category, among other things, in terms of making sure that there's enough to hunt. And one of the things that Ankakox uh, would do traditionally would be to uh, cover, and I think this still happens in some communities, is to like cover their eyes and then be surrounded by people who are singing and drumming and then go into a trance where they descend into the underworld, not like the underworld like hell, but underworld as in like down into the ocean, but spiritually, and then go sort of negotiate slash communicate with the um, divine being who oversees the prey animals down there and make sure basically like, hey, how are things going? Are you going to keep kind of making sure that there's enough walruses to eat and enough seals to eat, enough whales to eat? Uh, so trances were very important in this tradition and are important. Uh, dreams are important within this context. Oftentimes sacred stories come out of dreams. Um, and there's a, also a rich kind of tradition of understanding animals as um, sentient beings and also as kind of, as we've talked about before, this sort of fluid dynamic between animals and humans. So there's a story here, and I'm not going to try to share it to you, probably because I'm having issues with videos popping up on uh, actually recording properly when I try to show them during these recorded lectures, but it tells a story about a young boy who was mistreated by his grandma. He was fed dog meat rather than like good, well-cooked meat, and he gets very upset with her, um, and eventually um, she... I think I'm trying to remember the details of the story. It's like she falls into the water and then he refuses to save her. And she's like, save me. And he's like, she's like, I'll, I'll be nice to you now. And he's like, no, you're, you'll be nice to me again by feeding me dog meat. And sort of she ends up sinking and then she becomes a loon. Um, and so it's kind of this story that um, acknowledges sort of a fluidity between humans and animals where humans are transforming into animals. And I'm probably telling the story very poorly. And if so, I apologize to anyone who knows the story properly. Um, and I'll try to make sure that next time I speak of it, I speak of it better. But the point here is not so much the specific stories to suggest that there's a wealth of sacred stories that establish a more blurry division between animals and humans than is sometimes established in other cultural traditions.